So Tanya, what can philosophy tell us about love? Well, philosophy actually has quite an interesting relationship to love because on the one hand, love is actually already in the term philosophy. If you go to the literal meaning or the etymology of philosophy, then it's philosophia. And this first element, this philo element is, sort of, is a version of love. I mean, it's mm. also, it's philia comes from philane, which is also connected to friendship. And that in a sense also already points um, to the fact that there are different concepts of love that one could think about there. In any case, philosophy has this sort of element that it's a kind of striving, it's a kind of desire for something. And what it is a desire for is this other element, the Sophia, this wisdom. So that immediately sounds a lot sort of heavier, but really what philosophy wants to do is to, is to try and get there, is to try and explore actually what can we have wisdom of and how does this wisdom come about? And this kind of the fact that it's an ongoing strife is the kind of thing that is indeed sort of reflected in the name. On the other hand, philosophy has a bit of a difficult relationship to something like love because philosophy is very reason based, it's very rational, mm. it's very focused on rationality. And in that sense, it sort of finds it difficult sometimes to deal with emotions and especially the kind of emotion like love that can be so overwhelming that sometimes really rather mad things can come out of it. And a philosopher like Plato is very good at bringing those things together and indeed also thematizing that there is something quite mad indeed, quite strange, quite alienating perhaps even about love, but at the same time we need it because it's our kind of motivating power. If we are not really driven to do the kind of thing that we want to find out about, then it's not really going to go anywhere. Then we are just going to be satisfied with superficial results. So to really push through to finding out what something is sort of like what actually really life is or what a good life is, or these sort of really big questions, then the ongoing love for that investigation seems quite crucial. And at the same time, then sort of trying to reflect back on what philosophy can say about love is, is yet again, a slightly different kind of issue, which also some philosophers indeed take on explicitly, like Plato, who writes dialogues about love, whereas other philosophers would say, well, let's rather make love the kind of thing that sort of delineates where we are not going, where maybe other mm. disciplines would be going, like psychology or anthropology or so. So in that sense, it's a bit of a schizophrenic relationship, I would say. But uh, of course, I'm also very curious to hear what can a historian <laughs> say about love and how does love come up as a history topic? Well, I think what the historian can bring to love is uh, the ability to place it in context, to think about it in terms of time and in, also in terms of space. One of the key questions for a historian is, I suppose, is falling in love the same in the 16th century as, as it is in the 20th century or even the 21st century? Um, and what we can do is to think about not just differences in the experience of love, but differences across time in its status, in its significance, um, in its uses, and also um, in what people uh, what the significance of it is for people's behaviour, their actions, um, the kinds of legal marriage contracts that they might or might not enter into at any given time. So history allows love to be placed in context. I think it also um, allows us to think about love from the bottom up, depending on the historical approach. Um, I think um, the past is awash with ideas about love, um, whether they're ideas from poetry or novels or more recently films. But social history in particular can allow us to think about how people um, in their sort of everyday lives understood the significance of love um, and what they did with it, what they chose to do with it, and what the limits of their agency were in relation to love and more broadly to emotion. So I think that's what history does, context. As a historian working on love, um, one of the key tensions that I sort of find in the sources that I look at is between uh, desire and pragmatism um, and the way in which people are trying to juggle those two things, often within this context of marrying. Um, and I'm kind of wondering what, as a philosopher, you see as the central tensions at play in love. 
there's a 20th century philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas, and he has used the term ambiguity to describe a kind of internal tension at the core of love. And uh, for him, this this ambiguity of love has something to do with the way in which love, on the one hand, indeed has a lot to do with myself, and that would be, I think, your pragmatic perspective, but also very much with the other, the beloved. And so he has then brought two terms in to sort of describe the difference between that. Um, and these two terms are need and desire. And a lot of times we use them to, to term something that would be almost the same thing. But for him, need has a lot to do with sort of bringing something into myself that will help me and that will satisfy my needs. Whereas desire, in this interesting sense, would have a different character from need. And desire would be about something that is such that, on the one hand, I cannot really sort of bring it into myself anyway, because it's something that is really different from me, like this other person whom you know, that sometimes sometimes there's perhaps the expression like you want to swallow somebody whole, but at the mm -hmm. same time, there's certainly the realization you're not ever going to do that. <laughs> you know? And um, and so the, the desire bit actually then has to do with indeed sort of being directed at the other in such a fashion that, well, according to Levinas, that kind of desire will always only get deeper. It will never really be satisfied like this need aspect of things. But the more you actually get to know the other person, ultimately sort of the deeper you fall in love with them, the more fascinating things you find out about them. And that then also would indeed have something to do with who we are as human beings, that we have lots of secrets and a very sort of interesting inner world and also a very interesting world relationship in general that somebody else can sort of explore about us. But because love indeed has both of those elements, there's mm. something sort of that concerns myself, but there's also something that crucially concerns the other. Levinas says there, there is always going to be this ambiguity and we just kind of have to try and accommodate that and play around that in a sense. One can actually find something quite similar also um, in Plato if one starts looking for it mm. um, in the sense that um, there is sort of that there is something about love that might seem to take us away from from other human beings and might make us just exclusively focused on this one other human being but at the same time there is also something about love that sort of alerts us to the beauty of life in general or the fact that we are creatures who also have very interesting spiritual dimensions and intellectual ideas. And so in that sense, love can even bring us into philosophy rather than love being something that is just only about the body. So you always have this kind of ambiguity played out in different dimensions and with relationship to the different things also that we are as human beings and that are important to us as, um, as embodied creatures, but also intellectual beings. That's really interesting. I mean, so, so love is a sort of process of revelation about, you know, self-knowledge, but also um, un unraveling, uncovering the layers of another person. Um, is that that idea that that process, that act of uncovering of, of somebody being revealed to you has a finite point or is it a process that just goes on? The point would basically be that that indeed goes on. And, and there is actually a um, feminist philosopher, uh, Lucy Rigorai, she writes quite a bit about that. I mean, um, she finds it very interesting that Plato emphasizes that Eros has this character of always being in between. It's initially introduced by um, sort of re the realization that Eros is neither uh, ugly nor beautiful, but between mm. those, and that that's why this desire is kind of ongoing. But it can then actually be taken to quite a number of um, other dimensions. And the idea being that really our our life has this character of constant becoming and not mm. really ever sort of coming to the point where all is finished, all is done, we are like entirely saved or something like that. But we are going to always stay in this process of becoming as long as we are alive. And uh, Luz Irigaray is very watchful for all sorts of attempts to bring that to a kind of still stand because she thinks that um, that there are also lots of temptations in us to think that love should have a goal, love should have a telos like 
a child, for example, could be yeah. the sort of product of love. But then the whole challenge would be to make sure that this movement of becoming can still be um, kept up after that. And uh, so she's, she's very sort of watchful for those moments, especially in male philosophers such as Plato, but also Levinas, Merleau-Ponty, where they have some really good insights into this sort of character of love as becoming, as in between, as in flux, but where they then all of a sudden assign some kind of a goal or product also to love where this process would come to a standstill. And she thinks that in a sense, the contribution of feminist philosophy could also be to really try and keep up this in-between space and have the courage to do that rather than thinking, okay, but, but now it's enough. The parent of, um, of a friend of mine said, we want to close that drawer. So that was sort of <laughs> an image for marriage. You know? yeah. it's, been, it's been open long enough. So now that is done, moving on now with life and career and so on and so forth. That, that's a rather different model of love. But it is a very persuasive kind of image because actually it's the, it's the basis of most romantic films. Um, the, you know, the romance ends on the marriage day and that's it. That, <laughs> that's the end point. But I was, I was really interested in the idea that I mean, that in the middle of the 20th century, there's a very clear idea amongst contemporaries uh, that men and women love in very different ways. And it's not necessarily that women are inherently more romantic than men. Um, in fact, it can often be the opposite, that women are inherently more pragmatic than men because love matters more for them um, or is seen to matter more for them. So I'm kind of wondering about your, your, your point about sort of feminist philosophy and love um, and that sense that, that male philosophers are more, um, perhaps more hasty about wanting to close love down, and close down the process. Um, is that something that you detect as well um, in, in the philosophers that you use? Do you, is there a clear gender distinction in understandings of love? Yeah, I think so. This, the whole sort of idea that something is for the sake of something is this sort of idea that uh, teleology or having a telos to an activity is, sort yeah. of, is the kind of thing that also, of course, makes it much easier to rationally deal with that activity and indeed assign a purpose to it. And when the purpose is just rather instead the sort of deepening of the desire mm. or so, then that doesn't quite uh, cut in as nicely, sort of conceptually speaking. And that's why there would then be, for example, attention in somebody like, say, Levinas, who on the one hand emphasizes this, this eternal ambiguity between need and desire, but who also, just like Plato, comes in at some point and says, yeah, and then there's the child. And so fecundity becomes sort of the purpose of love. And then a next chapter can start, which then with philosophers, with male philosophers is a lot of times then the story about the state and politics. And <laughs> we can start building, you know, we have the family in place, yeah. they look after each other. Now let's see how we organize things sort of more widely speaking. It's about order, isn't it? It's about the desire to impose order, to see order, to impose it, um, rather than, uh, I mean, I, I always find a lot of the history that I do, it, it it's, char it's characterized by messiness. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't, mean that there aren't patterns to it but those patterns are, are, are far mess, are, are very messy um, and sometimes difficult to discipline in the way that sometimes academics want to discipline their sources or to discipline their narratives or to discipline the causal factors um, and actually sometimes it can't be disciplined it just is it just you know it just is and has to be kind of pulled around and um, and played with a little bit more.